thank you all for joining us on Public Square. I would like to start with Kendra over here to my right. Um, Kendra, you and your children right now are at a shelter and you're getting services at CLN Kids. Can you tell us a little bit about how this happened, how you ended up there? We left um, my kid's dad in March. I actually um, applied for assistance and I couldn't up, um, I couldn't comply with the work agreement, so DYFD actually referred me to um, the safe house. Here in Albuquerque? Yeah. And you left because um, your um, husband was abusive? Yeah. And how old are your kids? Um, two and a half and one years. Okay. One year old. How do you think that's impacted your kids? They had a hard time transitioning to the safe house. Um, they weren't used to um, all the rules. Um, they had a hard time with different people, you know, seeing all the strangers, but they, they've adapted really well since being enrolled in school. The decision that you made to leave, even it meant all this uncertainty, why did you want to do it? Because that's, that's a little scary. It's scary, but um, I actually grew up seeing um, trauma my whole life, um, not just with my parents, but also with my family. Um, in the culture, everything. Everything, it seemed like it was normal. And I didn't want to be um, putting that on my kids. So you wanted to break that cycle? Yes. In a way? <laughs> okay. Um, and your son's the older one, right? He's yes. He's two and a half. Have you seen impacts on him? He acts out, but he's actually in play therapy now. Um, he's learning to talk more and he's actually sprouted a lot since being at the school. Okay, and Angela, your CLN is where he is, that's your organization. It offers early child development for homeless families. Yes. And when kids arrive at your door, what are some of the, the things they're displaying that have to do with what they've gone through? There is a certain amount of acting out or um, lack of trust that the children may be exhibiting when they come in. And so, you know, it's natural for them, especially once they're in a space that they feel is safe and we, with the, the trauma-informed work that we have the program structured in, for them to begin to feel free to share more of those emotions as well. So the work that you do with them, she mentioned play therapy, is sort of helping them be okay with those emotions and, and so they can be out in the world? And, exactly. Okay. Some of that is what we call trauma release. And it's also about how to um, reframe and refocus and learn how to express some of those emotions and those frustrations or, or the anxieties in constructive ways. And are the parents involved in this as well? Absolutely. Because uh -huh. mm -hmm. that, does that help you to be involved with yeah, your son? as that's he's? What I want. Mm -hmm. I want it to be involved with um, pretty much everything that he's learning so I can learn how to take care of him and for us to be successful. Megan, Las Cumbres is somewhat similar. You're working with um, families or young children who maybe have come through trauma. And I wanted to get a sense of when you're doing surveys with them, which we call ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences, what is that? ACEs are um, potentially traumatic events. Um, Homelessness, domestic violence. Domestic violence, parental incarceration, sexual abuse, um, emotional abuse, physical abuse, neglect. Um, and you know these are things that can happen to a child um, from the time that they're born until they're 18 years old. And so you know we really use the screening tool um, with the child, the parents, um, the whole family system to really try to understand what has happened to this family um, as opposed to what's wrong with this family. And that you know really helps us get a sense of where the family's at. How does that inform what kind of services you refer them to or that you offer? Well, once you understand these things. Right. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we're really coming at it from the perspective of trying to prevent um, families from experiencing these things. And so we try to put a lot of our emphasis in prevention work with home visiting services, um, referring, making sure families have um, access to basic services like housing, 
food um, so that they're not experiencing stressors that can lead to things like domestic violence and like child abuse and neglect. You didn't, did you have a home visitor when you had kids? Um, yeah, I had one when I was pregnant with my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, she'd come in and see how we were doing. She'd um, make sure that my son was okay. Did she see that, did she know that there was domestic violence? Yeah. Did she, was it, I mean, did she offer you resources or services? Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, I got lots of resources, but I um, still was trying to uh, make things work mm -hmm. and they didn't work, so. Okay. And Renata, I wanted to ask you, um, you're working with uh, Native kids a lot. They're under these added stresses. These things come out in schools. What's the, what's the result? I think so many times, um, especially working with Native American families and looking at the historical outcome or the effects of what education in itself has done to um, our, our families. Um, I grew up on the Navajo Reservation and, um, and it was one of those things where you would witness, but you were silent a number of times. Right. And then when you started talking, you realized that your neighbor down the street next to you around you was going through the same thing. Yeah. And I do these spiritual things called healing circles. And, um, and as, as I started to listen, it was, okay, what are some of these barriers that are occurring? Because schools have a tendency to ask parents they're not engaged, they're not involved, and maybe they don't care. And, and then when you look at the realities of it, it's not they don't care, there's just so many barriers that are keeping them from being part of their children's lives. So in the healing circle, it was one of just talking with families and asking the question, you know, what are some of those barriers right now that you're feeling, especially as a parent with a child with a disability? Because they were blaming themselves, they were thinking they did something wrong, you're really not dealing with your own personal stuff. You're dealing with a long range of trauma that has existed all the way back. I, I, and I can take it to my grandmother who walked the long walk of the Navajo. And, um, and so it was, how do we look at this place of understanding, especially with Native families? We want them engaged, but they have this history. How do you stop that cycle then? I mean, um, I know you've you made a consistent effort, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> conscious effort to stop it. And I really think right now it's the spiritual component. It's the taking spirit and recognizing its identity. Let's figure out who you are. Ah. And then let's figure out, okay, who you are, and then what's the meaning of your name? And then once you sort of define that, then you sort of give them a voice. Then they feel a little more confident about what they have and where they're going. And so that connection of spirit also was you have a name, and in our Native American culture, we have clans. And so it was signifying that your clan system has been with you throughout back time, and that's your spiritual connection to why you're here today. So let's expound on that. So that, given that sort of building those particular resiliency skills, I wanted to ask Rashmi, so what happens when Let's say that that doesn't happen. So for kids who experience, um, you know, a series of traumatic events, it it ends up um, it ends up having pervasive consequences. Um, things like a sense of self, sense of trust in the world, um, uh, whether or not a person um, can regulate their own emotions, sometimes even regulate their own body. Hmm. Um, uh, it can have effects on the emotional recognition and affect recognition in others, the ability to empathize with others. So, I mean, just basic things that make us all human um, are really dependent on children having certain kinds of experiences and experiencing safety and having uh, uh, <coughs> support around them. You mean, we can't protect kids from all adversity, obviously, so what's the difference perhaps in brain chemistry for a kid who, fa they face adversity, they get the supports, they need to work through that versus someone who doesn't and doesn't get those supports. Prior to age 10, trauma, any kind of trauma, has a significantly greater impact than trauma later on in life. And, and the things that are happening are related to neurochemical systems, cortisol, which is one of the stress hormones, that there's a dysregulation in that hormone. Um, 
uh, structures related to basically developing self-regulatory capacity and self-knowledge, all of those things are not necessarily developing fully in, in kids who don't have appropriate supports and who experience neglect and trauma. So the cortisol is the fight or flight, and so everything, everything becomes a fight or flight response. You're going to say yeah, something, if I John. I could add something. Yeah, one of the things that I think is the most profound injury when someone experiences retreated, uh, repeated trauma or toxic stress is the sense of isolation mm -hmm. and alienation and the impact that it has on the attachment of the child or, or the adult with the people around them. You know, m many, many people feel just by themselves with the trauma and it's hidden. Um, and so I, I really applaud you, Kendra, for being here. Um, I think it's really important for you to tell your story so that other people out there know that they're not alone. Yeah. You know, and the healing circles that you do, I think, are so important to, to rebuild that kind of connectedness because it's in the connection and the relationship that healing happens. You and Javier are working at your clinic, and, and the, over the last year you've done a pilot project surveying people, um, asking about stressors or ACEs maybe um, not only for children but for families in general. What are you finding when you're asking these questions? What initially was happening is that families were just answering no to most of those. No, I'm fine. Uh, everything was fine. Yeah. So then we started with a little pilot uh, project basically continuing to, to ask those questions but then also say something to the parents. We say um, we are very concerned about you and your child, about your physical and emotional health. And uh, we want to know in the last few months since we last met, uh, are there been some stressors that make you, uh, uh, that affect you? And, and if, there, if there were, are how many of those continue to, to stress you? And uh, the last question was very critical, which was, Despite all of those things that have happened to you, tell me about it, the good things that have happened. Mm -hmm. And that has really opened up uh, things for us. So is that when people would say, oh, nothing's going well? Or, I mean, this is when things would come out? Well, interestingly, first they would pause and then look at us and, and they kind of almost question, did I hear you right? Are you asking me what good things have happened? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, other times were responses like, I haven't thought about that in a long time. Uh, nobody has asked me that. And then there were tears, many times, not always, many tears. Uh, and then other times, that was the opening door, say, well, actually, and then all these other things came out. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, was, it was about creating the culture of, of safety where things could be communicated in a not judgmental way. Screening doesn't mean just giving somebody a piece of paper and asking them to fill it out. What it means is having a meaningful relationship um, yeah. and, and a meaningful conversation about the person's life. Raven, you know, this sounds like a model that doesn't have to just be in the Southeast Heights with people who are under poverty and other stressors. It sounds like a pretty healthy model. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <For> everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. You know. And what's so beautiful here about um, the work uh, being described at YCHC is it's really built around a strengths-based approach and moving towards a resiliency model, not just a deficit model. So it, I, you brought this up before, but it's the, the language of asking not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. Yes. What, how does that shift everything when you just take that approach? It does help to take some of the, the stigma and shame out of the experience. Not, um, and also it sort of um, says that we don't think that this is about you and, and who you are on the inside, but just about the environment and the experiences that have occurred that have a deep impact on you. Much of, of behavioral health services are really built around this deficit model, unfortunately, asking what is wrong and really uh, sometimes only prioritizing what are the problems and issues um, going so on with you. So when you do this, do you, see, do you see changes in children's behavior when you do this? What can you talk about that? Well, I, I, absolutely. There's, okay. uh, there's uh, dramatic changes when um, and, and I think it's, 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 it's maybe be a misnomer to only focus on the child, mm -hmm. right? Because the, the, the focus really has to be on 
the child in the context of the family in the context of the community, right? Because this is the ecosystem the child lives in. Absolutely, and mm -hmm. that um, the brain development that Rashmi was talking about takes place in the context of relationship. That's why it's so important to not only uh, focus on changes in children, but changes on parents and, and helping them relate to their own emotional well-being and how, um, how they respond to the world, what kinds of triggers they have because of their own traumatic experiences, and how that maybe translate to how they're reacting to their child. And so when you have a conversation and you're able to kind of start to expand people's awareness, the, the change is dramatic. The change is dramatic. I, I imagine that when you've had this conversation, for the way that you've ch you interact with your kids has been really different. How, how would you think that it's impacted you? With the school, they really helped um, with the parenting classes that mm -hmm. we attend. They really improved our relationship with our son. Um, he, he's, he's usually a quiet kid, and now he's just like breaking down all his walls. And I really try and get him to name his emotion now instead of you know just getting upset. I try and really ask him what's wh what happened. Why are you why are you sad? Why are you crying? You know, and mm -hmm. he's he's come a long way. Mm -hmm. I sense that there's this growing body of of knowledge and research that we need to make this shift. Usually systems take a while to adjust, but I'm curious if you're seeing shifts, Raven. I know your your group is doing some training with Albuquerque Public Schools and COAFD. We are. We're, um, we're committed to training systems and organizations in trauma-informed care, which really is shifting into that resiliency model and would value universal screening, such as has been mentioned. Part of what our clinic um, and team has is, is been dedicated to doing is training a cadre of professionals who can provide, um, across the state, who can provide trauma-focused uh, therapy. And the uh, research base is really moving more towards a model of treatment that really recognizes and works to develop competence and a, a clearer sense of identity and self-development, which has a lot to do with um, skills and learning and problem solving, organization and planning. So that's more the shift towards resilience models within the treatment world. Well, and as we move into the second part where we talk about solutions, I just wanted to ask Kendra one last question. When, mm -hmm. you know, now that you have um, this work with CLN kids and with your son, and you're thinking back through interactions you've had along the way, how could people have helped better? <laughs> you know? um, they could have listened. Okay. A lot, a lot of the times I run into um, a lot of institutions reading me rules mm -hmm. and reading me regulations and what I can meet and what I can't, you know. Um, yeah, they don't really listen. And CLN listens. A lot of the places they refer me to they want to know how they can help me. And they actually do follow through with help. Um, but, you know, it's just you can't give up. Can't give up? Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the things that I've got to say is that it, it does require a, a shift in culture. Mm -hmm. It's a culture that is in both places. And I say both, meaning it, it's not only about um, what the agencies provide, but also in the in what the families begin to come to expect from the agency. Yeah. So um, I think you you talk about the uh, importance of somebody listening, mm -hmm. uh, or the importance of this screening happening in a, within the relationship, mm -hmm. and and we're trying to implement this in in a system that rewards efficiency, mm -hmm. and efficiency means check marks and computerized uh, mm -hmm. medical records um, and, and not necessarily an open-ended question that leads to uh, a narrative, a, a story. That, that is what's going to be changing. That's what's be transforming. So yeah. in a system, medical system, uh, just speaking from my perspective, um, it, there is a conflict. Efficiency and open-ended questions, listening, 
compete, their competing values. Hold that thought, we'll be right back. We bring in our leadership to talk about what kinds of changes we need to make systemically.